Hello, everyone, and welcome to another in our Wharton Ready Livecast series. Um, it's wonderful to see that nearly 3,000 of you registered for this event from across the globe. I'd love to welcome back all of you who've been with us for the previous livecast, and it's great to see this learning community across the globe grow with each and every live cast. Um, before passing it to Professor Fader, I'd like to point out the best way to engage with us is looking over to your right hand side. You will see there is a Q&A icon. Please use that to um, ask Professor Fader any questions you have throughout the um, presentation. There's an icon two up from that that has the silhouette of a person with a chat box. That's the moderator chat. If you're experiencing any type of technical difficulty, please just chat with the moderator and they will help you through that. Um, and now it's my, my, my pleasure and honor um, to, to introduce um, Professor Fader, Pete Fader, who is going to be focusing on a compelling consequence of COVID, a call for customer centricity. And in Pete's you know, as those of you who know him, his always customer centric um, way, he is going to extend this a little beyond the um, 30 minute mark so that he can get all of your questions and answers or many of them as, as he can um, questions answered. So this will extend beyond 30 minutes to possibly 40, 45 minutes. We will cut it at 45 minutes. So again, use the question and answer box. And with that, Pete, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, and you know, I'm looking through the camera here, and it's just wonderful to see so many people tuned in and, and engaged with this topic and this series as a whole. Oh goodness, I'm seeing all the people out there. It's nice to see so many familiar faces, but lots and lots of new people, uh, people whom I haven't met, uh, folks who maybe uh, aren't even familiar uh, uh, with the Wharton School and executive education. Uh, but welcome. Uh, it, it's great to engage with all of you. Uh, of course, I'm going to be talking about COVID like uh, everyone else in this series has done and will continue to do. But I have some interesting, very different angles on it. And I want to start by talking about myself. Because it turns out while the rest of you are going to the grocery store and fighting with each other to get that next roll of toilet paper, um, I'm eating out every single meal. In fact, literally, I've been to a grocery store one time here in Philadelphia since this whole thing started. But it's really interesting because I always eat out. Uh, and, and before this whole crisis started, I had only one app uh, on, my, uh, on my phone, uh, which was Sweet Green, for those of you who are familiar with that, that fine quick service restaurant. Um, but now that you can't just walk into a restaurant anymore and you have to order through the app, now I've been adding all kinds of other apps to my phone. Uh, and so there's, there's a whole bunch of, of restaurants that know something about me that they didn't know before. Now, I'm not here to talk about eating, I'm not here to talk about restaurants, but, but I hope that you see this is a relevant example because in every single industry, for better or worse, purchasing behavior has changed. And obviously we wanna understand the nature of those changes, but more important than that, we also wanna understand how those changes, whether those changes will continue when the crisis ends. So that's really what I want to talk about with you. So, so let's not just talk about the tasty food, let's talk about the tasty data. So if you think about all the activities that are going on, all the thought leadership that's taking place around the COVID crisis, it's about leadership and decision making and empathy and, and stuff like that. I'm here to talk about data. I'm here to ask a bunch of questions. Again, I'll just frame it in the, the context of a quick service restaurant. But you look at these kinds of questions over here. Now, these questions aren't new. These questions are by no means unique to the crisis, but I hope you'd agree that asking and answering these kinds of questions would be really, really relevant for it. We're looking at either that big spike in sales or that big dip in sales, and we wanna understand uh, the nature of those changes and what life is gonna look like on the other side of it. So many companies right now are, are experiencing one wild swing or another. And they want to have a sense of, is this the way things are going to be? And my contention is that, first of all, those are super important questions. They should be getting a, a much higher priority than they are for a lot of companies that are just in total crisis management mode right now. And number two, to the extent that you really want to understand the nature of that spike or dip, you need to break it down. 
you need to decompose it into each of these different kinds of behaviors in order to really understand what's going on. Now, before I go on, it's really important to tell you what I'm not talking about because I'm a marketing professor and you're seeing questions like those and I know what you're thinking. So let me just put this, this important, uh, it's not even a caveat, uh, maybe uh, some of you will be relieved to see this. I'm not going there, okay? I'm not gonna talk about how we can use all that juicy, delicious data to do all kinds of targeting, this and that. Turns out that one of the things that I've seen in so much of my research is that a lot of that stuff doesn't work well anyway. And so I'm actually hoping that this crisis might uh, help us be a little bit more disciplined. And instead, of, see, the problem is that our technology, our ability to serve up ads and do one-to-one -one this and personalize that is way ahead of our understanding of what the data actually tells us. So I'm hoping that we can take a step back from that and not go there. And there are things that companies can do that will be so much smarter, so much more effective, that will add so much more lasting value than just trying to hit people with different kinds of ads for stuff that they've either already bought or will never buy. So we're not going there. So the question is, where are we going? And of course, the big theme here is customer centricity. Now, for those of you who know me and know my work, you know where I'm going with this. But for most of you who don't, you're looking at those two words and you're getting the wrong idea. You're thinking, aha, I know, I know, I know. He's saying, you gotta be nice to the customer. We have to treat each customer like royalty. We have to be there to kind of fix it for them and show them the love. No, no I'm not talking about that either. What I am talking about in kind of very just general colloquial terms is this. And the words I really wanna emphasize, the stuff that I do for a living as a researcher and teacher is number one, to acknowledge that our customers are incredibly different from each other. There is no the customer. We should never talk about our customer in some kind of singular way. And it's really important for us to understand those differences across customers. And to get a little bit more specific about that, I'm talking about behavioral differences. So there are some who are gonna buy from us all the time, some who aren't. Things are changing right now because of the crisis, and so, you know, we see certain kinds of people who are buying much more than they did before, some people who are buying much less than they did before. Are those going to be ongoing behaviors or will it change when things go back to normal? That's what we're trying to get at. And by the way, it's not just a marketing thing either. When I talk about being laser focused over here, I'm not just talking about the CMO obsessing over the data and understanding these differences across customers. I'm talking about the CEO, the CFO, the COO, the CTO, you name it. I'm talking about an organization-wide focus and understanding differences across our customers and finding ways to leverage those differences to create ongoing value in a sustainable, ethical, defendable way. So that's customer centricity. Uh, again, some of you might be familiar with my first book on it. Here is the formal definition from book number one. You can see it's essentially the same kinds of words over here. The whole idea is to figure out who are the who are the, that select set of customers and what more can we be doing with and for them to create that kind of ongoing lasting value. It's not just a matter of traditional business as usual and going to the R&D team and say, hey, R&D people, what's the next cool thing you have in the pipeline for us? You know, get, get us that thing and then we'll figure out how to get the customers to buy it. No, that's not what I'm talking about even though I know that that's what most of you do. I'm saying, hey, R&D people, we got these really awesome customers over there. Come up with something for them. That's what I'm talking about. And I've been talking about this for over 10 years. And at first I was kind of either dismissed or kind of said, or companies would say, well, we don't do that. Um, but people have been listening. And here's book number one. I've sold over 60,000 copies of it. Hey, and I'm really happy to say that we'll have a revised version of book number one coming out in just a couple of weeks. Basically the same content. I didn't want to change anything. I wanted to make it a time capsule of what I was thinking about 10 plus years ago, just wrapping on kind of a new preface and afterward to say, I told you so. So that's what I'm talking about. And again, the key expression here is the idea of a select set of customers. And so, you know, how do we go about figuring out uh, who that select set is? And again, for those of you who know me, you know what the next three words are gonna be, customer lifetime value. Hey, listen, I wanna show a hands right now. I'm gonna turn the cameras around on each and every one of you. 
Uh, if you have the words customer lifetime value, whether you do the calculations or not, but if you have them as part of your working vocabulary, raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand so I can see it through the camera. Okay, I'm, I'm checking it out real quick. I can't see all several thousand of you, but this is very distressing. Yes, it's nice to see some hands up, my former students, but the rest of you, it's really, really important to recognize that not only are the customers widely varying, but we can measure it. If we can project how long that relationship is going to last, how many transactions are going to occur over that horizon, how much someone's going to spend or how much margin we're going to make on each of those transactions, if we can project each of those things out separately and add all that up, that's going to give us the predicted value of each and every customer. This is the stuff I've been talking about for 20-something years. The models work amazingly well, but there's a lot of companies out there that either don't believe it or they're too busy doing other stuff, focusing on the product or whatever else to, to, to bother with it. Or even if they do believe it and they are trying it, they can't win over their other internal and external stakeholders. That's my job is to convince you that this lifetime value thing is real, it's valid, it's actionable, and it's game changing. And this COVID crisis is a chance for us to step back and say, you know what? We're in a deep hole right now. We got to figure out our way out of it. It's not just going to be by developing and pushing products. It's going to be by having a better understanding of our customers and those differences across them. Some of you might be familiar that back in 2015, I took a lot of this research that I've been doing. And I've been so happy that the Wharton School and Wharton Exec Ed gives me a podium to talk about it all the time. Uh, I went out there and started a firm called Zodiac, where we're working with a wide variety of companies, you name it retailers, pharmaceuticals, travel and hospitality, gaming companies, telcos, all kinds of different companies to give them the CLV magic wand, give them the opportunity to wave that thing over each customer's head and to see the value of the customer. And then to go back to the company and both summarize all of that value, show them how it varies and then help them take action on it. Listen, I want you to look at this picture right here. Okay, look, look at the, the, the circle in the middle. Okay, and I'm gonna, Track your eyes right now. Okay, I'm looking to see where your eyes are going. Okay, and it's very interesting to see what you're looking at. Uh, what you're thinking right now is, huh, this is kind of interesting. You know, I took all those stats courses at Wharton, and they told me that everything was normally distributed. And this distribution over here is anything but that. In fact, it's the polar opposite. And if I really focus where your eyes are going, it's going to the spike on the right. You're saying, whoa, there are some customers out there who are incredibly valuable. What is it that we as a company can do with and for them and to find more customers like them? And if we can do that, we will make more money than just obsessing over the product and our operational capabilities. And if you go back to book number one over here, what were the key words in that title? It wasn't customer centricity, which is just a bunch of blah, blah. It was the right customers, okay? That's what I'm talking about, is every company, I don't care if it's B2B or B2C, I don't care if it's a product or a service, I don't care if it's some big expensive thing or some mundane, uh, you know, low involvement item, I don't care if it's domestic or international. When you wave the magic wand and you see the value of your customers, I'm pretty much guaranteeing you that you're gonna see a picture like the one you're looking at over here. And once you see it, and once you see that spike on the right and you say, Stuck with those customers, you're going to start thinking differently. So, so that's uh, what, what, what happened with Zodiac. It was a wonderful opportunity to kind of take a lot of these models and bring them to life at full commercial scale and help companies act on them. But if you notice, I'm talking in the past tense about it because just about two years ago, we sold Zodiac to Nike. And of course, it was a wonderful outcome, not only financially, but also in terms of, of validating these models, of validating these ideas of customer centricity, of getting a lot of other companies to say, well, wait a minute, if a big company like Nike, which tends to focus on its products or tended to focus on its products more, is doing this kind of thing, then maybe we should be doing it too. That's exactly my point. I want companies to move in this direction, but I want them to move the right way. Because it turns out that what I just mentioned a few minutes ago, and basically what I've been saying for most of the last 20 years, isn't really the right way to get going. 
For years and years, I've been saying, hey, here's the CLE magic wand. If you just wave it around and see the numbers and see that histogram that I just showed you, money is going to come raining down from the sky. Not that easy. Okay? It's, it's the, even that, that might win over the marketing people, but it's still going to be hard to win over the other C-level folks in the organization. There are so many issues at stake, including things that a quant, pointy-headed numbers guy like me has kind of no awareness of. Things like company culture, things like organizational design. There are so many issues at play. But what I've discovered just in the last few years is kind of a really interesting spin on it. So again, there's a lot of literature out there. There's a wonderful book by Jay Galbraith uh, about designing the customer-centric organization, talking a lot about how the organization will look differently for a customer-centric one versus a traditional product-centric one. Talk for days about that kind of thing. But I want to talk about something else. Here's a surprising way to get the conversation going. Don't start with marketing. That's going to sound kind of strange because I'm a marketing professor and a lot of these things that I, I, I work on are primarily focused on marketing. You know what I've discovered just in the last couple of years since establishing Zodiac and, and selling it to Nike? Start with finance instead. The thing that I'm working on these days is this idea of customer-based corporate valuation. If you take the same kinds of data, the same kinds of models that I referred to at the outset of the session, that if I can predict how many customers are going to acquire, how long they're going to stay with us, how many transactions they're going to make, what they're going to buy, how much money we're going to make off each of those transactions, if we can project each of those things and add that up, well, that's the overall revenue for the company. That's the overall value of the company. That we can do a better job of forecasting and understanding revenue and cash flow by doing it in this bottom-up way rather than the usual top-down way that we teach in most of our finance courses. That not only can, if we take revenue, we break it down into its components, will let us make better forecasts, but it will also let us make better operational decisions. It will let us understand not just the quantity of cash flow, but the quality of it as well. And once we can win over finance by saying, hey, look, we can do corporate valuation better, and we can look at different kinds of external events, COVID, to understand what kind of meaningful ongoing impact is it going to have on us, and then take action on that, that th this is the big win. And once we win over finance, then marketing operations, the rest of the organization, dominoes. They're all going to fall into place. Mentioned that I sold Zodiac, started a new company, Theta Equity Partners. And the whole point here, as you can see, is to revolutionize finance through customer-based corporate valuation. Now, look, first of all, I'm not a finance professor, and I'm not trying to push finance principles. I'm a marketing guy. Okay? I'm, a, I'm an overall strategy guy. And I'm just, under, I'm, I'm just realistic. And I understand that the heart and soul of the company uh, it rests in the CFO's office. And that if we can find a way to win her over, then everybody else is going to fall in line. And the very same models that we're using for corporate valuation will be the same models that we're going to use for marketing targeting and to evaluate product development and different kinds of ad campaigns and customer experience campaigns and, and all that sort of thing. It's been really interesting to look through this lens of CBCV and evaluate lots and lots and lots of private companies, but also some publicly traded ones through this lens. What are the quality of the customers that you have? How are they going to vary from each other? Um, what other accounting and finance aspects should we take into account? Uh, so, for instance, one of our, our pieces is we spent a bunch of time looking at the Lyft IPO and looking at this interesting contradiction of a company that actually has pretty good unit economics. They actually have a nice spike on the right of really valuable customers, but uh, just a bunch of fixed costs and things that, that drag them down. And I got to tell you just how heartwarming it is when a publication like the Financial Times says that the best article that they've seen is one by a couple of marketing professors. This is what I'm trying to achieve, is try to get all the different parts of the organization together to really understand customers and to have that influence all the activities that, that the organization is involved with. I'm interested in doubling down on it. In the a previous issue of the Harvard Business Review, uh, there you'll see that this article that Dan McCarthy, my former PhD student, co-author, now professor at Emory, uh, we, we have on how to value a, a company by analyzing its customers. You also notice a companion article by Rob Markey. Rob Markey, 
um, who some of you might recognize that name. He's a, he's a very esteemed Bain consultant. He's the guy in charge of all that net promoter score stuff these days. And recognizing that while NPS is an awesome measure by itself, the complementarity of net promoter score and customer lifetime value go together beautifully. And what we've done is we've teamed up to start writing lots and lots of letters to organizations like FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, basically saying, hey, publicly traded companies really should be required to disclose the kinds of metrics that I've been talking about, how many customers they have, how active they are, and, and, and all these sorts of things. And you know what? Folks at FASB are actually listening and asking questions. Now, I'm not claiming that anything's going to change tomorrow, okay? But we are saying that with the kind of data that we have today and with the kind of compelling crisis that's going on, we should be spending much more time looking at that data, thinking about it from lots of different perspectives, including marketing, finance, and other parts of the organization as well. Uh, so, you know, when I talk about customer centricity, I usually end on this slide over here uh, to think really hard about some of these kinds of questions. You know, who is the customer? I'm not necessarily talking about the consumer. If you're in some kind of B2B business, it's your supply chain partner. It's whoever you're selling to. If you're a pharmaceutical firm, it could be doctors, it could be insurance companies, it could be, it, it could be all kinds of different entities. Anyway, I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna answer all of these questions right now, although I hope that you'll be interested enough to ask me or look into some of the other content that we have at Warden Exec Ed to find out some of the answers to them. What I want to do is I want to take all these questions and frame them in the context of the COVID crisis. I am really hoping that this will be one of the silver linings. This will be one of the ongoing sources of value that, that the COVID crisis doesn't necessarily force, but compels. I really hope that people can kind of get out of this pure crisis management thinking, you know, will we have the lights on tomorrow to say, um, will we have brighter lights the day after tomorrow? That we can really learn, we really have the chance right now, let's say from the marketing side, when we're not spending time developing products, when we're not coming up with nifty ad campaigns or customer experience campaigns or things like that, to look at the data, to think about what it tells us, to learn about our customers in a way that we should be doing all along, but we're usually too busy with other stuff to, to make it a high priority. To get companies to look at a lot of the kinds of things to collect that data, to analyze that data, to build an organization around that data, that a lot of times the companies would say, eh, those would be costs, okay? We're too busy investing in new product R&D and stuff like that but to recognize that, that higher quality data and analytics that arise from it are bona fide investments and, and really, really important. Of course, a really important theme here that I keep emphasizing is it's not enough just to win over marketing. We gotta find ways to get the whole organization on board. Uh, and I keep talking about getting finance in there too, but we have to find a proposition where this customer centricity stuff will be compelling, will be actionable to every part of the organization. And I believe that we can achieve that. And of course, the, the last question is here, when times get better, do we say, <laughs> what are we thinking? Oh, that customer centricity stuff, no. Let's get back to developing awesome new products. I want there to be a lasting change along these lines. And if you're interested, if you wanna join me, you can reach out to me. And here's all my contact information. Here's book number one, which I said is a new version of it coming out in a couple of weeks. And if you're not familiar with it, hey, there's book number two. Book number one just tells you about what this customer centricity stuff is. Book number two talks more about implementation. How do we build a winning strategy driven by customer lifetime value? So if you're interested, you can learn more through those books or all kinds of other content that I have out there. That's my thing. That's my story. And of course, lots and lots of other content. I hope that for those of you, if this is the first time, you're going to go back and look at some of the other, uh, the, the, the three other uh, uh, webinars that, that we've had so far and lots and lots of other content that, that uh, Wharton and Wharton Executive Education can bring to you. That's my story. Um, I wanna hear your questions about it. Uh, I, I hope that we'll have uh, time to, to get to, to some, if not many of them. And again, for the rest of you, I hope that it can be an ongoing conversation, because I think it's a really important point, and I bet that for a lot of you, it might be the first time that you're hearing and thinking about this stuff. Hope that it won't be the last time. So uh, let's turn it over to some Q&A and let's see what you all have in mind. What are your reactions or what are your thoughts? So what can I help you with? Great, thank you, for Professor Fader. We have a lot of good questions coming in, which I'll get to in just a second here. 
Uh, just want to remind you that please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions to Professor Fader. Uh, a lot of questions coming in about the recording. You will have access to the recording post uh, webinar here. We'll provide that to you. So please don't worry about that. Uh, Professor Fader, a lot of questions coming in about uh, culture. In your mind, um, what culture is right for customer, customer centricity to succeed? That question is killing me. It's killing me. Because look, I, I'm, I'm very candid about the fact that I, I'm not a culture guy, but I'm actually starting to make early steps on what will be book number four for me on this topic. It's what I call the five C's, creating a customer-centric corporate culture. So I, I have spent some time just, just reading some of the literature out there on corporate culture and, and likewise on organization design and so on. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that that this strategy is so different uh, that it's not just a matter of taking the kind of textbook elements of an effective corporate culture and just kind of jamming them into this kind of framework. Because what we're talking about, again, is, is upending the usual business model in such a drastic way, not only through the processes that we follow, but the metrics that we use and just kind of day-to-day -day conversations that we have. So to be super honest with you, I don't have the answer to that question yet. But I will also acknowledge that answering that question is at least as important as having the CLE magic wand. So stay with me. And in fact, if any of you have some ideas about it, it's so important, it's so new, and I'm so open to it that I would love to pick up that conversation with you. If you understand what are the elements that would be particularly good for customer centricity in terms of corporate culture, let me know. You can point to organizations that really get it, love to talk to them. So, so that's, that's very much a work in progress wish I could tell you more, um, but at this point, I'm more listening than talking on, on, on that issue. Thanks, Ed. Great, Professor Fader. Uh, so another question coming in about the trust in some of the industries that are greatly impacted, like the service industries, the hotel industries. Um, do these companies need to take an extra mile to win the trust back of these people that might be hesitant to kind of go back to these ways? You know, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marvelous question that also takes me into an area that's not necessarily my main expertise. The answer is, of course, yes. And it's really important for me to emphasize that as much as I'm talking data, 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 models, forecast, CLV, that that's not enough even on the marketing side. So, look, we, we have to be really smart about our messaging. We have to be really smart about our product offering. All I want is for us to elevate the, the, the customer and the CLV uh, piece of it to be at least on an equal level with things like the brand. I am in no way diminishing the power of the brand and the importance of coming up with, with messaging that's very consistent with what this, this brand's proposition uh, might be. But I want brand and the customer metric stuff to at least be kind of eye, -eye with each other and complementary with each other. Too often, companies, if they're ignoring a lot of the customer stuff, they're just saying, what messaging can we come up with? And you know what? I'm going to be really honest with you. If you look at a lot of the really the lame ads that all these companies put out there when the crisis started is, we love you, we're with you, we know that maybe we can't be with you right now, but while you're home, we're thinking of you. A bunch of BS, right? Um, so we really need to come up with, with messaging that really is better aligned with what we're good at, with what kinds of customers are the ones who are really striving even harder to continue to engage with us, even when that might be difficult. At the same time, for companies that are enjoying a sales spike, let's say certain quick service restaurants or other companies, instead of saying, hey, everybody loves us, is having this recognition that a lot of those customers might be here today, but they're going to be gone tomorrow as soon as things get better. You're not going to win them over. They're only here with you right now because they have no choice. So it's really important to sort all that stuff out. And when we seek to get trust, when we seek to kind of communicate the right way with our customers, once again, we have to recognize that not all these customers are created equal. And no matter what we say, many of them are going to be gone tomorrow. So it's actually really complex to get that right. And we just want to use the data to help inform that messaging. So Professor Fader, um, what should be the, one of the most top priorities in organizations from a customer centric, uh, centric point of view once the COVID-19 situation kind of eases a bit? In your mind, if you could focus on a couple, what should be some of the main priorities from the customer centric? Yeah, if you give me a couple, I'm going to give you a couple, data and analytics. You know, too many companies look at collecting that data, tagging and tracking customers, trying to do the omni-channel thing where we can tag the same customer, whether they're buying in a store or online or whether they're using social media. And again, I'm not 
talking about the creepy stuff. I'm not talking about then hitting them up with ads and, oh, you're going to love this too. I'm not talking about that stuff at all. It doesn't work that well. But it is important to do that kind of tagging and tracking and householding to bring all that data together. Companies are not making that a high enough priority. Now they're seeing like, oh my gosh, you know, now that we've lost one of our channels, our retail stores, man, we wish that we had invested a long time ago so that we could have uh, looked at the ongoing e-commerce purchases and had a better connection between those and the retail purchases. So it's getting the right kinds of data. It's so important. It's so boring compared to a lot of the other stuff that we do, but it's vital. It's the lifeblood of the organization. That's number one. And number two would be the analytics. It's not enough just to look at the, the overall data and say, hey, we're selling more stuff, or hey, we're selling more stuff to millennials, or hey, we're selling more stuff in, in Nebraska. That's not enough. It's the analytics. It's getting below the surface of the data to really start to ask and answer the kinds of questions that I mentioned at the outset. And again, that's one of the things that makes Wharton so special. Uh, Wharton Exec Ed, such a, a wonderful resource. Then instead of just saying, oh, we have some numbers, let's crunch them. It's no, let's get below that. Let's tell the story of what's going on below the data and, and kind of the, the, the behavioral drivers of why certain kinds of customers are staying with us and others are, are, are one and done. So data and analytics. I mean, look, I'm a broken record, but I really do believe that companies haven't been uh, allocating enough resources to those skills. Uh, and I really do believe that if you listen to me, uh, that, that uh, things really will change on an ongoing basis. We have a lot of questions coming in about the uh, reset points or maybe reviewing some of the modeling in their CLV models. Do you see a lot of businesses maybe looking at this data and maybe trying to maybe reset or review their current models for CLV? Uh, it's so important to do that. Uh, well, I mean, there's really two, two aspects to, to that question. Um, one would be the way we go about calculating CLV. Um, there, the answer is not really. Uh, I, I'm happy to say that the models that I and others like me have developed over the years, and one of the reasons I've been shouting about this stuff for 20 plus years is that the models work so well, and they're so incredibly robust across different business settings and different business situations. I'm kind of comfortable with the basic math behind the models, but where the reset occurs is because today we're looking out there and not only are we selling less stuff, but we're selling through fewer channels and to a very different profile of customer than we'd be selling to before or after. So the reset occurs about, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We have to look at these changed sales patterns right now and say, you know, what's up with that? And, and how can we combine the limited data that we're getting today with the richer data that we had yesterday to make better statements about what tomorrow is going to look like. So, and if that sounds like a, a kind of a challenging statistical issue, yeah, it is. And that's what keeps me gainfully employed, taking these different kinds of data sources and leveraging the value from them and combining across them in order to make better understanding of how many customers they're going to acquire and how long they're going to stay and so on. So as, as a specific example, you know, back to my, my current company, Fade Equity Partners, we've got a number of companies, whether it's direct corporates or private equity firms, coming to us and asking that question. You know, we're getting the data from this first month of the COVID crisis. What is that going to tell us or what's going on on an ongoing basis? So we're using basically the same models but just using some statistical adjustments to figure out the right way to balance the current data with the past data to make statements about tomorrow's data. It's hard, um, but that's where kind of doing real research and, and really thinking carefully about these problems instead of just summarizing the numbers and saying, oh, sales are down 20%. That's not enough to really understand what's going on and help give us a prescription for what should be going on in the future. We're going to continue to take Q&A for about the next 10 minutes here. So, Professor Fader, how do you get below the data better when your engagement models include a middleman and maybe an interpersonal relationship with that person? Well, you know, I like to, I, I think middleman is, is kind of a bad term. I like to think of a middleman as, what should I call the middleman? How about the customer? <laughs> So in many cases, uh, if you are just selling to a middleman, whether it's a distributor or a retailer, uh, and you don't necessarily have visibility about what's going on further down the supply chain, then maybe that entity that you're selling to is your customer. 
and maybe you should spend more time thinking about them and, and what they're buying and how those middlemen vary from each other. So in many, many cases, when I'm talking about customer centricity, I'm not talking about consumer centricity. I'm talking about the relationship with that entity. So, so it, look, it would be great if we could augment the sales to our channel partner with those of their downstream channel partners. And I've been having some wonderful conversations with a number of companies about how to do that. And once again, part of it is a data problem. Like, hey, middleman, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to be you know, customer centric with you. I'm not going to treat all of you the same. But by the way, if you could give me some data from or insight about your customers, I can help you do your job better. So um, uh, one of my, my favorite people is Neil Hoyne of Google. And, 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 and we're always talking about this kind of thing, about how can we take these ideas of customer centricity and pay it forward so we can help our supply chain partners uh, act more effectively and, and bring to them a wide variety of resources uh, and, and, and having them maybe pay it down the stream to, to, to their customers as well. So, so middlemen are often customers, and these principles and, and practices and, and metrics apply directly to them. Okay, Professor Fader, can you elaborate on the difference in ownership of the customer and a house of brands via a branded house model? Yeah, I'm, I, it's, a, it's a really, really good question, I, and, and it's one that, that's just so relevant today, you know, as, as a lot of people look at, uh, you know, at a wonderful company like Louis Vuitton, you know, a house of brands, and a lot of people trying to uh, uh, kind of emulate that model and, and so on versus others where, you know, there, there's that one big brand at top and, uh, and, and then just a, a, a bunch of, uh, of kind of subsidiary brands with it. Um, these models can, can really help you uh, understand uh, which strategy uh, operates more effectively. I'm going to just get a little, little technical with you right here. You know, should we develop a separate CLD model for every one of the different brands that we sell? Or should we be truly customer centric and say, we're going to bring all of that data together and understand our customers at a granular level, looking across all of the different brands that they buy from us? So, I mean, that's, that's my way of reframing that question. And of course, there's value in doing it both ways. So, you know, if indeed from, from one brand's perspective, if all they care about is what their customers look like, and it's frankly not that important to them um, what, uh, how their customers are, are buying from their sister brands, um, then that's fine. Then, then you can use the models and you're going to see the same kinds of patterns and it's, it's, it's going to be all good. But from the corporate standpoint, there is something to be learned. Instead of just doing a separate CLV model for each one of the, the brands by recognizing that, hey, you know what? Um, these customers are buying in a kind of an unequal manner across the portfolio of brands. And in particular, if we can look at the corporate level and say, um, among our most valuable customers, that big right spike on the right, which one of our subsidiary brands are they buying disproportionately more from? Right away, it's going to give us some idea about how we should be allocating our resources, spending a little bit more time, attention, money on, on certain of, of our brands and others. Uh, also giving us ideas or other kinds of brands we should de be developing. So, so, so these models can be very useful in, in, in both ways. Uh, ultimately, ultimately, if, if, if you're going to press me on it, uh, uh, being Mr. Customer Centricity, uh, I'd rather not operate uh, e each brand as a separate business on its own. I, I'd rather be a little bit more customer centric with it. And I'm really happy to say, without naming names, that some of the the, the big you know, world's most, you know, famous, powerful house of brands companies were clients with Zodiac, uh, and they were actually looking to do that kind of thing. It's how much can we learn across the brands to, to get some synergies to, to really understand overall customer buying and not just brand by brand. So a lot of really interesting issues there. Back to you, Ed. Right, so we have a lot of questions coming in about startup companies. Uh, so what approach and methods would you recommend for a startup company maybe does not have all the customer data at this point? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really tricky with startups. And I have to tell you, uh, even though the principles apply there, they really do, uh, the, the, because you don't have that much data, it's harder to trust the CLV models. Now, I want you to listen carefully to that word that I use. I didn't say that it's hard to run the CLV model. Take the data on your limited customer base and run the models, and they're actually going to work fine. They're going to be surprisingly good. But 
here's the problem, that those early buyers that you have are not representative of the overall potential buying population. Those first few people who are lining up around the block to buy your product, they're, they're, those, they're those people are that spike on the right. They're not giving you the full picture and you're gonna get a real distorted view of what the market looks like. So in order to really, really trust these models, my advice is, and this isn't gonna really help you very much, but if you wanna use these kinds of models, you kind of have to wait. Um, my, my usual advice, like for instance, when companies come to us at Theta Equity Partners, we don't work with any early stage VCs at all. We say, we need 10 to 12 quarters of data. We need to wait about three years so that we can start to see the, the, the different kinds of customers. Again, those early ones are gonna be terrific. The next quarter customers that we, that we acquired in the next quarter, a little bit worse, a little bit worse, a little bit worse, a little bit worse. So we need to see a broader spectrum of customers in order to really understand what that customer base is gonna look like and therefore which kinds of customers we should be really focusing on, how to allocate resources across them. So for startups, the principles do apply. And you wanna start building your organization in a way that's gonna allow you to take advantage of them as quickly and as seamlessly as possible. So for instance, here we go again, it's back to the data and analytics. You know, there's too many startups that are saying, it's just all about the product. Let's just get the MVP, that minimal, minimum viable product, and just get it out there and sell it to anyone who will buy it. And while I understand that, there's constraints on time and effort and money, you need to be tagging and tracking every single customer from day one. You need to start building that CRM system, even if it's just an Excel spreadsheet, and starting to look early on, even as you just move from quarter one to quarter two, how is that mix of newly acquired customers different than it was before? You need to start having the discipline to start looking at some of this customer stuff early on that when you get a little bit further in, you know, a couple of years down the road, um, it's not a matter of like flipping the switch and say, okay, it's time to start doing the customer thing. Uh, it will be just part of your, your general business processes. And I got to tell you, honestly, a lot of these digitally native companies, you know, many of whom have Wharton roots, haven't really done that that well. And for them, they're either flipping that switch um, or they're still not doing it. It's the ones that kind of get these ideas from day one that are in a better position uh, as they mature, take advantage of some of these principles. Ed? Great, so up here, this will be our final question of the, of the session here. So a lot of questions coming in about um, what we want versus what we need. Um, do you see a lot of customers' mindsets changing where they refocus on what they actually need and what, or what they actually want or what's nice to have, like luxuries and things like that? Is that going to be? You have to ask me such a difficult question as the last one. You know, it's, it's really, really important. And actually, again, it's a chance for me to show a little bit of humility at the end over here. Remember, when I showed you my slide before with the red underlines on it, I'm focusing mostly on behavior. I'm focusing mostly on who's bought what in the past and what are they gonna buy in the future. It's very important to get a level below even that, the idea of, of, of wants and needs, the idea of, of, of attitudes and motivation. I'm gonna admit that that's not my strong suit, but fortunately, half of the marketing department at Wharton uh, would be folks who really focus much more on how people make those decisions instead of just how many times will they buy the thing. And it's that beautiful interplay of, of, of looking at people's behavior and triangulating it with their, their, their attitudes or the words that they express in social media. Or perhaps if, if we use um, uh, you know, a neuro tracking or eye tracking or other physiological measures to really understand what's going on inside the head as well as what's going on with the cash register. That's where it really all comes together. And that's why marketing is such a rich and interesting discipline and why Wharton is such an awesome school, because we have the best of, of all breeds. So the answer is, yeah, it, it is really important to get to that. And as we start to see that, certain, that these customers are different from each other, it's really important for us to ask the why question, which again, is above my pay grade, but it's really important to do that. And doing so in a way that's mindful of the behavioral patterns, that's where we get the real learning uh, and where we can make not just marketing, but the organization a whole operate even more effectively. So with that, uh, I have I've taken far too much of everyone's time. I, I hope that it has been time well spent. Once again, delighted to keep the conversation going and very thankful for Wharton for giving me uh, th this opportunity to talk about some of my ideas and to blend them with the ideas that you'll hear from some of my other colleagues as well.
Pete, thank you so much. I'm going to speak for all of us. It was amazing. And um, I just like to highlight that this differentiates so many Wharton faculty like yourself who've actually been teaching online for years. This isn't something new to you. Uh, you know, everybody, Pete Fader teaches a lucky few hundred people a year in his MBA classes and in exec ed, but he's teaching continuously thousands of people a year online and you can see that dynamic presentation and there's so many other faculty at Wharton who are doing that so I'd like to remind you that we're doing something completely different next week it's Peter Capelli designing a remote work and managing personnel issues so different hat on but so relevant right now during COVID-19 and please note that we're also leveraging a lot of this faculty expertise for you know engaging live connectivity while we are remote and safe and doing Wharton live casts of full programs whether it be custom or online do check that out at the Wharton live page and executive education thanks again look forward to seeing you next week at 10 a.m. GMT, or sorry, 10 a.m. Eastern and 1400 GMT. Cheers, everybody, from all of us at Wharton Executive Education. Stay safe and stay strong. <laughs>